last year they were the biggest band in the country. Very catchy songs that'll stick in your head, songs that'll stick with you, like different parts and bits of songs that you'll be listening to. You'll find yourself like just kind of playing in your head, and you just kind of can't get away from that, it seems, sometimes. Trailblazing innovators and sonic alchemists My Chemical Romance are one of the most compelling, intriguing, experimental and exciting guitar groups to have emerged in alternative rock this century. We're from New Jersey, we're the state of the misfits, you know, we're punk rock. I think the thing about My Chem is that I've always been aware of is, you know, what the, the black clad kids in high school are listening to. You know, and at one time they were listening to like The Cure and Sisters of Mercy, and when I was in high school they were listening to like, you know, like Metallica, and uh, and then after that it started to be like Nine Inch Nails and Manson, and now I really think it's it's My Chemical Romance and that sort of breed of gothic music. It's just that dark element. It makes it more interesting than just cheery, poppy songs, and, and that's what My Chemical Romance is. Where you know nerds in this country have gotten a gun and shot the popular kids, and since then, there's been a little bit more of an acceptance of the, of the nerdier kids. And there's almost a tongue-in-cheek like, hey, the dark nerdy kid is going to kill us. And so everybody should be a little less cruel to him, maybe. And I, I really see that as being sort of how My Chemical Romance have become this popular nerd dark band. Where it's, you look at those kids and you're like, wow, if... They had taken a different course, they might have shut their high schools up, you know. <laughs> the group took their name from the Irvin Welsh novel, Ecstasy, Three Tales of Chemical Romance. Their artistic impulse has produced some truly radical, life-affirming, haunting, potent and groundbreaking material. This is their story. Jersey, sometimes known as the Garden State, is often overshadowed by its neighbor, New York. As the largest chemical producing state in America, it's surrounded by a gritty industrial landscape. This makes it a tough neighborhood to grow up in. Just sort of the image New Jersey has in and of itself, it's got kind of this gritty image, this sort of, uh, you take a drive through like Southern Jersey, through Elizabeth, those kind of areas, you see all these factories and this industrial area. It's a pretty gritty place in certain areas, and a lot of these kids that come from Jersey do come from some of these more gritty areas. Uh, my town has an industrial section. It's got uh, a sanitary landfill right next to where like the kids play soccer, and then there's also the, the prison. Jersey gets probably more shit than like any state in, in the Union, you know? And so I think Jersey kids, Jersey bands, feel like they really have something to prove. And there's a lot of history here to live up to um, musically. Artists like Bruce Springsteen setting the stages in like the 1970s, like you know songs about the streets and you know cars and just and girls and, and just living in a densely populated blue collar area. And New Jersey, for the most part, for being so densely populated, is mostly blue collar. New Jersey has a history of producing raw, gutsy bands, with the music often reflecting the area. With fewer opportunities in the real world, many teenagers turn to music as a way out. But the competition amongst bands is fierce. Also, the proximity to New York puts extra pressure on these bands to really perform um, and to really prove themselves, because New York is such an infamous scene and has brought forth so many great bands. It just builds up that inferiority complex. You know, if, if you're coming from Jersey, you gotta like lay it down because you have a lot to work against. We've always lived in the shadow of New York. And that's why people create basement shows and hall shows and, and uh, you know, do everything that they can do in order to make a, a mark on something. And there's a lot of competition amongst bands because there's so many because of the populations of bands. There's only a handful of places to play. So to break out, you need to be unbelievably good because there's so much competition. So when bands break out of here, they break hard. They break 
Springsteen, Bon Jovi, My Chemical Romance, like big. Because they're the best of the best in the country. Gerard Way was born in Newark on the 9th of April 1977. His younger brother Mikey was born on the 10th of September 1980. They were both brought up in the small, quiet town of Belleville. Belleville is sort of a suburb of Newark, if that's even possible, because Newark is sort of a half-assed city in the first place. So to be a suburb of that is just a stinking place to be. It's not like a New York suburb where, like Hoboken, where there's a lot of money because there's a lot of commuters and stuff. Belleville is in between towns and it's, it, it, there's not a lot of um, character to it. It's got this sort of suburban facade kind of to it. But at the same time, it's got that sort of, like, it's got the highway that's running next to it. It's got, you know, the, the strip malls that are all dotted everywhere and, like, the, your Kmarts and your big kind of commercial things. Um, there's not too much, like, just to do, really. Gerard and Mikey both attended the local school, Belleville High. Gerard was a highly artistic and sensitive individual, prone to bouts of depression and mental instability. He loved comic books and horror movies and was fascinated by the macabre. He played in local bands until his early teens. At this point, he decided to become a comic book illustrator. After graduating from high school in 1995, he attended the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Gerard's life changed forever on the 11th of September 2001 when he witnessed the attacks on the World Trade Center. He was left deeply affected by the traumatic events as he realized how fragile life was and how it could be taken away in an instant. And he snapped after 9-11, his brain snapped. As far as I know, it's one of the bigger reasons why he started this, started My Chemical Romance, because he was down there and watched it happen. You know, we're only six miles away from New York City here. It was insane. I remember driving down the street and mothers were running from schools with children in their arms. Just like people are panicking. It was total chaos. That really freaked him out. He didn't leave his house for a while after that. Gerard struggled for a long time trying to break into the comic book art world. He felt depressed about the negativity surrounding the profession. He stopped socializing and his friends began to have concerns. At the, the, the time I best remember of him really me saying, you know, Gerard's losing it, was he was in his house for, I would say, maybe two, almost two months, drawing Spider-Man over and over again. And he got the gig for Marvel to do Spider-Man, and he bailed on it, which to me was a sign that this kid's really losing his mind. He can't handle it. If he gets a gig like that for a company like that, it, what the hell is he going to do when, when anything else happens? I knew he was very creative. He had told me about all the stuff that he had done with uh, the comics, all the drawing, all the, all the stuff that he's done. So, yeah, I think you have to be a little bit crazy to be creative. So we had an intervention, me, Mikey, Gerard, you know, uh, a couple of our other friends, and he started getting better. He definitely started getting better. So he decided he wanted to start a new band. Gerard contacted an old high school friend, the drummer Matt Palicia, also known as Otter, and they decided to make music together. Their first casual jam took place in late 2001. Gerard felt restricted by his inability to sing and play guitar at the same time, so Matt and Gerard invited the guitarist Ray Toro to join the group. This freed Gerard to focus on honing his vocal abilities and performance craft. Genuinely impressed with his older brother's aptitude and ambition, Mikey Way decided to learn to play bass guitar in order to join the band. Time is running low. There's not much further left to go. It was all local kids, Otter, um, Ray, Toro, 
and Gerard start jamming in, in, uh, in Otter's attic. Alex Saavedra is the founder of Eyeball Records, the label that helped turn My Chemical Romance into MTV superstars. At the forefront of the New Jersey music scene, Alex has built Eyeball into a leading indie record label. They came over one day with this like this this three song demo. I was like, "Well, this is pretty good, dude. Like, you guys, this is this is pretty awesome." Um, you know, and it's funny because before Mikey was in My Chem, I was gonna play bass in My Chem, but I already had another band that I was really stoked on. And I was like, "You know, this band's My Chem Romance is cool, but I'm really into my band, and I'm super busy with the label, so." Why don't we teach Mikey how to play bass? Now Mikey already knew how to play guitar a little bit. He wasn't very good at all. So he didn't know how to play bass very well either. At first it was just everybody teaching him how to play bass, teaching him how to tune bass, which was just hilarious to think about because Mikey just really didn't know how to play it. But it's Gerard's brother and one of our best friends, so we definitely, we knew it, he needed to be involved. And that, having him in that band is what all of a sudden made us all realize like, this band can go somewhere. This band is incredible and everyone has to know about it. Eager to capitalize on the goodwill generated by Eyeball Records, the band visited the recording studio for the first time. With the addition of guitarist Frank Aero and the lineup complete, this session would become the start of the classic album, I Brought You Bullets, You Brought Me Your Love. First thing we recorded was uh, a song called Vampires Will Never Hurt You and which went on to be one of their, their uh, most popular songs. John Naclarillo is a sound engineer and owner of Nada Recording Studios. He first recorded My Chemical Romance in his mother's basement. Alex Saavedra called me on the phone. He was like, I had prior friendships with Alex Saavedra and he, he was like, you know, I got a band I'm really interested in signing called My Chemical Romance. So he called and I, I just gave him a day. He was like, yeah, just whatever day you got. And I was like, fine, come on up. And that was it, one day. We ended up doing one day for a song called Vampires Will Never Hurt You. Gerard, slightly overwhelmed by the recording process, just couldn't relax. The first day, definitely interesting. They came, started the song. Everything was going great. We didn't understand what was happening with sounds and stuff like that. So we were just like, all right, let's just take our time with this a little bit. Gerard just wasn't getting it. His voice was out that day. It was weird. I can remember him going over there and just they're arguing about something, fighting. So I went in there, I was like, dude, you gotta focus. And again, you know, I could see him starting to wander and getting overthinking everything. And he's just getting 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 crazy. I was like, dude, you gotta calm down. You can nail this song. Just cool out. I know it was it was just an emotionally charged recording session, you know, so there was lots of stuff going on. There was, there was arguments, there was, you know, but that's, that's always the signs of a good record. You know, it wasn't more like, you know, hey, you, you suck. It was, hey, you can really do this. Do it, you know? And I said that I walked out. He's kind of shaky, but better. And, and Alex, I'm sure you know, has a crazy personality just where he's just very intense. So he would get over there and just start yelling at Gerard. He did that a lot the entire time, just to get the motivation going more than anything. I went back in the studio and I said to him, I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to you. And he's like, what, what, what do you mean? And I punched him in the face as hard as I could. <laughs> and I said, you better focus now, dude, because <laughs> you could pull this off. Start doing the song. All of a sudden, the sky turned bright purple. After I did that, it started pouring outside, like pouring, thunder, lightning, craziness. <laughs> the sun was just gone, rain was pouring down. They're just like, this is the greatest day of our lives. We have to do this. It's going to be the greatest thing ever. He hit that song one take straight through. No punch-ins, no, no overdub, no, no nothing. So we went in there and the song turned out amazing and that was, that was the ambiance for the whole session. It was just like the whole, like as if every single world came aligned and everything was perfect and he did that song perfectly it was it was pretty amazing we all just sat back and we're just like whoa pretty cool
Impressed by what My Chemical Romance had recorded, Alex decided the band were worth a gamble and used his credit card to fund a longer recording session. Uh, Alex called me and he said, you know, we should do the rest of this album. We should get up there and do a couple of weeks. So he said two weeks would be enough. I said, sure, two weeks should probably definitely be enough. Little did I know, it definitely wasn't enough because <laughs> the time that they got there, once we started the session, it was trouble from day one. <laughs> Good trouble, though. That recording process was the one of probably the most insane, troublesome recording processes I've ever been through in my life. And I've recorded, I've worked on it at least 70 records. Um, Gerard had this, we thought he was losing his mind. He was in pain the entire time he was recording. We, nobody could understand what was going on. Once we started doing the vocals, he would get in there and just sing for like five minutes at a time, double over in pain. He was, oh, I can't do this anymore. He was having these pains in his head. Bad, bad pains where I remember walking into a room and hearing him smashing his head against the wall, screaming in pain. So I brought him to the emergency room. I said, there's nothing wrong with him. I loaded him up on painkillers. The next day, same thing again. Pain was more intense. Finally, all of a sudden, we just hear, like, what the hell was that? We go over, we look, and there's Gerard. He's on the floor. He just gets up, and he's just like, I think I just passed out, man. So we're like, oh, so we, we don't know what the hell's going on. So we had to call the ambulance, because he was the whole time just freaking out. So then it got really bad on the third day where I came outside and he was physically smashing his head in the hood of my car, crying and screaming in pain. Ambulance gets there, they take him away. We're worried to death. We're like, oh, you know, what's going on with this guy? He's, he's messed up. His vocal performance on that record is so distraught and sincere and you just feel every emotion on that record. Like, you feel every single word that he says. And I think him being in so much pain at the time has a lot to do with why it pulled off that well. Get the diagnosis back, it was just an oversized toothache. The guy was just in pain from his toothache the entire time. <laughs> that concludes Gerard. <laughs> The atmosphere in the studio soon became emotionally charged. It was amazing because a lot of bands are in the studio and they're they're playing video games and they're just kind of waiting for the whole thing to be over and you know they just get everything done especially on a first record they just want to get it technically perfect. There was something different up there when they were making the record uh, to the point that, that Gerard sang through the end of the song and Ray was crying because he was so moved by the vocal performance and by the emotion that was in there, and it was, the whole session was like that, where it was just like everyone was so involved and just blown away. His voice, first of all, was definitely one of the things that blew everybody away, the things that he could do with his voice, how he could make himself scream, how he could go back into singing, and not many people can do that, you know, not, without losing their voice very quickly, and he had a stamina that, that just went for, well, until he passed out. <laughs> The group began to work closely together. Frictions became magnified and cracks in the band started to show. Their old drummer was a, a wreck to work with, because he, sorry to say that, but he couldn't keep time for nothing. And we would sit and take the song over again and over again. And he was just speeding the songs up by 20 to 30 BPM, like a crazy amount. And he was like, oh man, we're never gonna get this. So. Alex was sitting there and he was just like swearing up a storm. Ah, ah, we, we gotta do this right now, this is, has to happen. He ended up getting the songs, but it was definitely a struggle with that. Mikey Way, who'd only recently learnt to play the bass, became the unsung hero of the session. Mikey Way saved the session. <laughs> Mikey Way, probably one of the smoothest bass players I've ever recorded. Just got down, he knew what he wanted to do, you know. By that point, we were so stressed out from time with doing the drums doing everything else, you know, the, the pre-production stuff, and, and Mikey just came in and, and did what he had to do. That's, that's one of the big things I remember, just being so impressed with Mikey. Yeah, Mike, yeah, you're ruling it. And he was just so like, cool, I did it, I'm gone. <laughs> with the album now finished, 
the band were working harder than ever at promoting the record. I start sending it to everyone I know. Everyone at labels, everyone in bands, um, you know, everyone. Everyone I could think of. So before we even had a street date for this record, you know, there was hundreds of copies of it out in the hands of, of everybody you could think of, you know. At the time, Mario Comensas was a college radio DJ for New Jersey's WSOU, creating the show Under the Stars. Mario played an integral role in exposing bands like My Chemical Romance, and he was the very first radio DJ to ever play their songs. SOU is, is one of the largest broadcasting college radio stations, uh, I believe, in, in the country. There's, it's almost 90 miles uh, you know, radius, and it hits some pretty concentrated areas of people in New York and in New Jersey and even small parts of uh, Connecticut. You know, at the time, in like 98, 99, we were playing music that you could not find on any other station, at least that available. There were other college stations that had a show maybe that would play uh, hard rock, metal, hardcore, things like that, but nothing that would play almost 24 seven like we would. When they gave me that first demo, which was um, Vampires Will Never Hurt You, I heard that song and just gave me goosebumps and I said, that, you know, I'm just gonna play you guys and see what happens on Under the Stars. And the reaction was ridiculous. And I knew that, that there's something special here and we'll see what happens. And look what's happened. <laughs> As far as on the radio side of things, I would give all that credit to Mario for, for breaking my chem. He took their demo tapes and played them over the air relentlessly and everyone was calling. By the time I had already come on the scene, they were playing our boat shows and, uh, and people were calling up for them at all the times. You know, I was just playing it for fun. These were my friends, you know, and I was happy for them that they were just, you know, just getting a good reaction. I'd like to see people going to their shows and I like going to their shows and having other people react to them. I was uh, in charge when we got the new record and we made the decision to make My Chemical Romance our number one priority because we knew that they were going to be, of all those CDs that we'd gotten over those couple months, that that was going to be the one that was going to make a mark for some time. When you count down the request, there was, a f there was just so much more for them than there was for any other band at the time. Uh, so, you know, I just helped get it played as much as possible on this radio station, get as much of the, the underground rock kids in Jersey. Uh, into it. To celebrate the release of My Chemical Romance's debut album, Eyeball Records organized a launch party at one of the shrines of New Jersey punk, the Loop Lounge in Passaic. This is where we did the My Chemical Romance record release show. This is where it all started. This is the first real club they've ever played. Um, this is the first club that would ever have us, quite honestly. And uh, we, this is actually the first place we ever played the record publicly also. So it's definitely a huge spot in the history of, of uh, Michael McGromance and Chemical Romance Records. The first time I heard uh, that record, I just thought it was accessible, but in, in a different way than everything else was at the time. You can actually make it your own. Like, no matter how you listen to it, you can put your own experiences to that album. And, and I think that's why people started listening to that because so much other stuff at the time was so selfish, they were just talking about themselves, themselves, themselves. This album was written almost in a way that anybody can take it and make it their own. There'd be A&R people outside of our house, like waiting for us to be walking in to try to talk to us about stuff because back then, we really wouldn't answer the phone when major labels would call us because we just knew that they were gonna be out there to try to steal one of our bands, which is a, real pain in the ass. So we got a phone call from a guy named Luke Wood. And Luke Wood was in a band called Girls Against Boys years ago. And uh, he's an indie dude, but a, a major label A&R. And I knew all about him. And I, I heard great things about him. So I said, you know, I want to talk to this guy. I want to see what he has to say. So we go down there and he chats us up about the record, psyched on it. And as soon as people found out that he was psyched on it, everyone started calling. And I knew that we had, we had the record that was gonna change a lot of stuff for us. It was, you know, 
there are lots of records we've done that I loved, and there are records we've done since that I like more than that record. Um, but there was something in that album where there was there was an electricity in just in the air around the band in general. We we knew it was going somewhere, and everyone started going crazy because the guy who signed Jimmy World and AFI is now after My Chemical Romance. Who's My Chemical Romance? I don't know because the record's not out yet. Some band in New Jersey on Eyeball, the, the label that did the Thursday record. Nobody had any idea. So we were psyched, man. We were really psyched. And, and the fact that we were able to, to, to get that record so buzzed out before even having a street date was just amazing. The band now began a series of grueling nationwide tours. Their lifestyle changed as soon as that record dropped. They were gone. You know, they were in their van and out. And then they come back a month and a half later and had to get a trailer to add to the van. And then come back three months later and, or two months later and had to buy a new van and a bigger trailer. And then come back a few months later and then they're in a bus. You know, it's like, it was fast, man, it was fast. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. So their lifestyle changed immediately, and they just tour, tour constantly. They tore their ass off. While My Chemical Romance were away on tour, rival record companies from major labels started to bombard them with lucrative offers. We took a long time um, before we decided to sign with a major. Um, we were in extensive meetings and we met with a lot of people and uh, you know we just basically like when, within a couple of months of us <clears throat> being a band like major labels were for you know for whatever reason already talking to us and for about like a year and a half we just told them no we just want to be a band you know we want to be left alone that's what mm -hmm. we want and you know they were cool people stayed away the very turning point for the bands i think was when uh, an a &R at DreamWorks made a phone call to get them on a show with Jimmy Eat World and there were uh, 7,000 kids at it and it was ridiculous and it was a sort of a taste of what these major labels were capable of doing in a single phone call that an indie label would have to work for months to do. So played that show, ridiculous, you know, and they slayed it, they were amazing. At that point we understood that they would probably be going to a major and um, since these were our, our friends and they were local, there was no contracts between us. There was a lot of handshakes, a lot of hugs, kisses, promises. What happened was we were doing so much touring and so much work and we kept hearing that, you, you know, I can't find your record in the stores and, um, you know, you, you, do, you work so hard playing shows for kids and, and hoping that they'll be able to take home a CD or find a CD if they're interested in it or maybe even find it on the internet and kids couldn't find their music and, and that's kind of what you know what drove us to sign to a major. Um, it was really just so you know kids could get our music. That puts a lot of pressure on a band and it puts a lot of pressure on an indie label because let's face it, Eyeball Records at that time could not break My Chemical Romance to the level they are now. Um, as the majors got more and more involved, the band and the management got a little more distant and being on the road a lot kind of keeps you out of uh, sight, out of mind, so to speak. So when they came to us and said, listen, do we, we really want to go to Reprise? We think that it's the best thing for us to do. And we said, okay. If that's what you want, man, that's that's cool, we understand. We don't want to keep somebody here if we're going to hold them back. It just makes no sense. And that comes back again to the sense of community and what's good for them is good for everyone else. And I'm not going to hold my best friends back to us to stay on eyeball and only have and not have the success that they, they could possibly do, have on a, on a worldwide level. We sat in on me on meetings with major labels. Uh, there was one in particular down in South Jersey where it was the president of Warner Music. Uh, 
an A and R, me, the band, and we went to an IHOP, and I found the guy to be so condescending to towards me and towards the indie community, and you know I, I was sitting there feeling offended to the point that I wouldn't accept them paying the check. I paid the check myself, and I was like, "Don't worry about it." And the band seemed to have the opposite opinion of the meeting, like, "Well, that went great," you know. And I was, uh, okay, <laughs> I, I thought it was horrible. Uh, at some point, it, it just, the contracts were just signed. I talked to Alex once. I called him up on the phone. I was like, hey, what's going on? It had to be about 11 o'clock at night. And he was pretty drunk when I called. He was, he was definitely like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, you know, I just had some crap happen with uh, my chem, you know? And he wouldn't really get into details about it. And he, he just said, he felt pretty devastated about what happened. I know that it wasn't a good thing. It was a hard, it was hard, you know, it's sad. It, like if somebody says, you know, we don't, we don't want to work with you anymore because we feel like you can't do the job that we want. But it wasn't said mean, it wasn't said meanly, it wasn't malicious, it wasn't, it wasn't messy. I was like, okay, dude, well, if that's the way it's going to be, then awesome. Best of luck, and I can't wait for the ride because it's going to be fun. And it, it, it has been. It's been fantastic to see these kids, you know, come back from playing Brett's Basement to they played the Meadowlands Arena, you know. It's just insane to think about that, to go from, you know, 15 people to, you know, 15,000 people in, in a matter of a couple of years. They would never have been able to do that with Thighball. Retroactively, after they signed, they went back and included us in that deal, which was really noble of them. It was really cool because uh, at that point, nobody was really talking to each other. They could have just backed away and they went back and they took care of us, which was cool. Uh, all the bands that we had been used to seeing playing, you know, Basement Shows and Bloomfield Ave and things like that, they were getting signed to major labels, so it wasn't the strangest thing. And I don't know, I, I read on, you know, gossip sites that Maybe it wasn't as nice as it should have been, but I, I don't pay attention to that stuff. And I know it was a lot of talk, a lot of gossip that was like, we had a falling out, they left, we don't talk to each other anymore, we all hate each other, and it's, like, it's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, I'm going out with Mike tonight, they're home right now writing, and you know, I talk to Mikey every day. And like I said, I talk to Gerard maybe twice a week now, but it's not, it wasn't like that at all. It was like, well, I love you guys, and I can't wait to see what happens. After carefully considering all of their options, they decided to go for Warner Reprise Records. The band felt the label would allow them a far greater level of creative independence. And the band has, you know, been smart and you know kind enough to be, you know, to honor you know their old ties. And so they, you know, they're always dropping the name of Eyeball Records in you know interviews. You know, they've said in interviews, like, we're always going to be an eyeball band. And I feel that way, too. You know, like, you know there, we, we did too much together to just turn your back on it. The group took to the road and toured constantly for a two-year period during which they generated a fanatical following across North America and Europe. Their reputation for incendiary, life-changing shows was as much of a pull as Gerard's well-documented alcohol problems. The way they you know, told me in interviews, it's like, you know, we want to be kind of a little bit dangerous. And the way that sort of translates on stage is just I mean, Gerard, again, it's just, you know, is very magnanimous, you know, just like he, it just becomes a different person when he goes on stage. Like, he's very soft-spoken in person, but on stage is just this rowling, you know, it's like this lion-like personality trapped in this man in a black suit. Gerard has always been a ham. Dude's always like, just up in your face. First time we saw him play, we're like, this kid is a star. He's just a star. He's always been a showboat constantly. He's cursing, he's just like jumping around. He just seems to have this I mean, it's like it's like the satanic preacher, you know, for lack of a better word. I mean, he's like every other word was was, you know, was bleep me if you will, fuck, you know, like 
I mean, and just, it was just, uh, it was just like, ah, you know, like, it, it just, I don't know. It was, but it was something that, it wasn't intimidating. It was just like, it really, it was rapturous. And like, you know, you could just feel like every time he spoke between songs, the crowd was just kind of, you know, like jumping up a little bit, like, you know, like the hair on the back of a cat's neck, you know, just kind of like, it was just really whipping people up into a frenzy. We used to laugh that Mikey would nail his, his uh, sneakers to the floor and then put them on because the kid wouldn't move. He would just stand there like this, like all freaked out because he's just learning how to play the bass. So he'd be like watching, watching his fingers, watching everything he's doing, not moving at all, you know, not looking at the crowd. I mean, the other thing that really I really remember from that concert was just like in between, you know, in, you know, in breaks in songs, in between, you know, songs, the other guitarist, uh, Ray Toro, would just scream out, Jersey, and, and just, you know, there was just kind of this echo effect across the room. People just started cheering louder, and just like, it was just this very exuberant expression, and it just amazed me that one word could just really, you know, send a shockwave through, you know, a thousand or three thousand people. You know, Frankie was already used to playing live because of his band before that. Ray wasn't, but Ray was a very confident guitar player. And as soon as, Ray's the kind of guy who would be, who would, uh, if he thought he was sounding really awesome that night, he would turn up a little bit, you know? He'd turn his volume up, you could, you, you could tell. It was getting a little louder and louder as he starts ripping on his guitar a little bit more. You know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of guy he is. And that's cool, that's what makes him a great guitarist and, make, and makes him write these great songs. signed to a major label, My Chemical Romance had stepped up a gear. The group, now perpetually on tour, began to feel the strain. In late 2004, the drummer and founding member Matt Palicia was asked to leave the band. I never understood what the issue was with him, why he was out of the band, or um, I thought he was a, a good drummer, played maybe a little too many machine gun fills on in most of their, their uh, recordings. And he was just a, seemed like a good kid that just loved pizza and just wanted to eat pizza all the time. When I did the interview with them, Matt was still the drummer, uh, so he was up here. And I think maybe like a month after um, that interview, they split up. It was sometime, it was right towards the, the beginning of the album coming out, if I'm not mistaken. At some point, I found out he got kicked out of the band, and I wasn't sure why. Uh, he was all about it. He had a tattoo of a bat on his hand. He was, he was into it, you know? He was the weakest link in the band. He was the one that, that kept it going with tempos and stuff like that. He couldn't keep the tempo going. The other stuff, I don't know anything about. I don't know if kind of personal problems they had. They already had a new guy lined up, and he was ready to go for a show. Like, that following week, it was something ridiculously soon. So you could tell that they had been preparing for this for some time and it was just breaking. Everybody knew from the start what was, what was happening when he couldn't get these tempos. We tried the click track, couldn't do the click track. We tried just mapping it out where he would just play the song and we'd stop. Okay, slow that next part down. Couldn't do it, just wasn't happening. Turned into an argument. Screw you guys, you know, I don't care. This is, this is what I do, this is how I play. I don't care, you know, that kind of thing. And we were all just like, just play the drums, get it over with. <laughs> Eventually, Matt went on the internet and he was saying things like uh, that they wouldn't let him uh, play without a click track. Well, click track is what drummers use to keep time uh, when they're playing live. It's a device, so he didn't like it because he thought the show should be more organic and if there's a mistake, there's a mistake and that's what punk rock is. And He had a whole thing about this that he posted somewhere and, uh, and that they wanted it to be really professional and tight or whatever and so when he didn't agree with that that's what caused the split is what he said among other personal things that I'd imagine they didn't go into in the public. Even if you still listen to the songs though you could still notice there's every song has a tempo change. It, it all speeds up. If you listen very carefully it's very obvious to me obviously but it, you can hear it speed up. Um, and I haven't spoken to, to Otter since he was done now. I've, um, 
he hasn't checked in with us. I think he's maybe he's uncomfortable, but we haven't chased him down either, so can't really blame him. He was immediately replaced by Bob Breyer, a drum technician with the band The Used. Uh, the only thing I remember about Bob um, was just, you know, after the show, just him walking around with like this towel hanging out of his mouth, which was kind of charming. Um, you know, I, I guess he's, you know, it's, it's striking that, you know, for the quote new guy on board, he seems, you know, as much a part of that band, you know, and I guess he, you know, he has to be. selection of songs, My Chemical Romance got back in the van and drove out to Los Angeles to record the follow-up to I Bought You My Bullets. They wanted to take their own live equipment into the studio, bringing some of the incredible energy of the live shows to this new record. Their second album, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, was released in late 2004. Yeah, I mean, we just kind of made music that we um, we wanted to hear, mm. you know, and we never thought that um, it would get to this level. We knew that we had, um, you know, we knew that we had won some fans over because we toured so much on, you know, on the first the indie record. Um, we did a lot of touring on that, and we knew that we had a, a you know, a pretty good strong fan base. But um, we could have never dreamed that it would have gotten to this level. That um, you know, we've been to Japan and uh, England and Germany, and now you know to Australia and. Um, I would have never thought that, that could have Well, uh, when Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge came out, about a week before, uh, we had planned to have My Chemical Romance come to the studio. Uh, we were going to world debut the album, and uh, we were going to really kick it off with a bang. We had been playing My Chemical Romance like every hour on the hour for the week before. Uh, it was a really big deal, and uh, so I did the interview. And it was a buzz about it. Um, after a couple listens, it, it's one of those albums that the first time I heard it, I wasn't into it. But then after the second or third time, it just latched on to me. And uh, and you know, so we did the interview, and it was great. And people were calling up like crazy, wanting to hear more and more and more. And, and we ended up playing, I think, everything but one song off the album uh, in like an hour. It's catchy. <laughs> like, I, I'll give my comfort romance that, like, just sort of from song to song. It's just very catchy songs that'll stick in your head, songs that'll stick with you, like different parts and bits of songs that you'll be listening to. You'll find yourself like just kind of playing in your head and you just kind of can't get away from that it seems sometimes. We first got like a rough version of I'm Not Okay and I thought that sucked. And <laughs> I saw Gerard one night and I was like, oh, dude, I gotta tell you, I think that song sucks. And he got so upset. And I felt terrible because I said it in a way that I would normally say things to him while we were all work, growing up together and working together. But I think that he, he just got back from the studio and I really hurt his feelings on it. Like, it hit him too hard to the point where I was like, dude, I, I didn't mean to like, make you really upset about it. I just, I don't like it. I'm, I'm sorry you freaked out. He's like, but it's not the final mix. And I was like, okay, cool, man. You know, and then I heard the final mix, and it's fantastic. It was awesome. It sounds like they spent a lot of time on it, worked their asses off. I think it's a better change for sure. I think what they got now is is incredible. It obviously, it pushed them to the next level. Um, I thought I thought it was miles apart um, stylistically from the Bullets record, and it wasn't where I was expecting them to go, but it was where they needed to go to keep their careers alive. I think. And I don't, it's not to say I think it was, it's sold out, but it was an evolution that absolutely needed to happen so they can cross genre lines and, and really continue to grow. Hugely popular with the fans and with just getting phone calls and requests and stuff like that for it. I love the record. I love it. I still listen to it at least three, four times a week. I'm not, still not tired of it. I think, yeah, I mean, I think it was an album that took everyone by surprise. Um, I you know I know it did great first week sales, but I think it was a definitely it was a slow boil to to the success that they you know that they've earned. I mean, 
you know, it wouldn't have become what it is now without, you know, years of touring behind it, you know, a lot of hard work on the band and, you know, their management and the promoters behind them. The sound of My Chemical Romance has evolved over the years. There are major differences in the recording techniques used between the first two albums. The shift from one label to another uh, influenced a, a change in, in production. You know, it was a little more glossy, uh, you know, I think. And, and I think at the time that, that it came out, they were just, you know, the album is great but it was a time that they really solidified their image more. They've certainly taken it to another level in terms of the songwriting. I mean, the hooks are just undeniable, you know? They're just like, these are like, these are almost anthems, you know? Like these are, there's a more like big sort of arena rock almost kind of feel, like it's almost like an arena emo kind of album, which is a real sort of contradictory thing to say because emo should be sort of like this music, this really intimate music that you're like singing, you know, you're confiding to someone. And yet they've taken that sort of intimate, confiding sort of aspect of emo and made it into these big anthems. Definitely, like I said before, when I heard Three Cheers, uh, it didn't grasp me right away. Uh, I Brought You My Bullets did. Uh, so it was kind of an adjustment period because it did sound different. Good bands from album to album aren't going to stick with the same exact CD over and over again because then it just gets stale and people aren't going to like it. So I think what they did is they you know, put out the first one, they saw what worked, they saw what didn't work, uh, and they improved upon that but at the same time they weren't worried to sort of reach out again and like try new things and different variations and stuff like that. Yeah. But when I heard the, uh, the full album, it was much more polished. The vocals were a lot tighter. The songs were somewhat shorter and, uh, and just tighter in general. There were, there were songs that were paid more attention to and you could tell that they worked with a you know, big time producer like Howard Benson. And like I said, it didn't catch me until I got to that ninth track, uh, Thank You For The Venom. And that was the badass song that Mike Hem needed on that album to really give it that punch as far as as far as we were concerned here. With the explosion in popularity for New Jersey bands led by My Chemical Romance, people are comparing the scene to the grunge explosion that happened in Seattle in the early 90s. Yeah, it's something that a lot of people have talked about and I know the bands are aware of that, that Jersey is being compared to the Seattle scene back in the grunge days and you know, some people have said that like Eyeball could be like the sub pop of, that, of this era. Um, but the funniest thing is when you talk to the band, they're sort of like very nervous about that comparison and sort of blown away by the idea, you know, that, um, that you could even make that comparison. I don't think, you know, My Chemical Romance or, or any of the bands that are coming after them are anywhere near the level of importance that, you know, Nirvana was or Pearl Jam was. There's not, it's not earth shattering yet. I mean, who knows what we'll see, you know, this year we'll see the next My Chemical Romance album. Maybe that will push it, you know, kind of beyond what it is now. But I don't think it's anywhere near as earth-shattering as, you know, or genre-defining or, or, you know, or bending, you know, as, as, as Seattle was. Uh, I think uh, as far as comparing New Jersey to the Seattle scene of the early 90s, I think there are certain, uh, you know, comparisons, but I don't think you're going to see as many bands reaching like multi-platinum status as you saw in Seattle. I think that's sort of a one-of-a-kind sort of thing. Um, but I think there's a lot of bands that are going to be, you know, definitely noteworthy in the next 10 years or so coming out of New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey right now is definitely, especially I've noticed more nor northern New Jersey, like the North Bergen sort of area, that area, that's been sort of this hub for this explosion of uh, emo as a genre. And even just as far as like seeing the kids, because you can easily identify the kids who are into the scene, seeing them and like just in groups and as just individuals, you see this sort of concentration in this area and sort of fans out from there. 
I think in Seattle with, say, the grunge explosion, you saw the same thing where you saw this sort of concentration of kids who you could easily identify who identified with the music and supported it and sort of just kind of got into it and pushed it from there. And that's again goes back to, you know, not just strangling something you love, but letting it grow and not being overprotective of it. Well, the Jersey scene has definitely come into its own. There's there's a million and one bands coming out of New Jersey. And they're all they're all pretty much the same, but they're all different in their own right. So I think in New Jersey you have the same thing where you have the scene that started relatively relatively new in the grand scheme of things if you look at, you know, the lifespan of certain genres. And it's just sort of exploding from there and from the national level to the global level, just like you saw with, say, grunge in Seattle. So I could definitely make the two correlations, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think Seattle had its time, but I think New Jersey has always had its time. New Jersey, from Bon Jovi days, they were like the, the place where glam rock and all that stuff came from. And Seattle came along, gave it a little nudge. But it's always been back to Jersey. There's just so many bands coming out of there. Gerard Way is often described as a highly creative individual who lives his life on the edge of sanity. I'm just worried that you think I'm paranoid for thinking the way I do. It's just the way I don't think things through. He's a very interesting character. I think the one thing that everyone always sort of talks about and he, uh, he always talks about his, his fixation on mortality. And I think, I think that's one of the ways that the band really connects with, with kids. Um, you know, teenagers are just so fixated with death. You know, I was fixated with death. I'm still fixated with death. And, and they just sort of tap into that, but through this sort of almost pop framework. He, he, he scrutinizes every little detail. You know, it takes a week to do the album art. It takes you know, uh, a week to write lyrics to one song. And every move the band has made, I feel like Gerard has, has really orchestrated that. So he's definitely a more interesting character, both his onstage persona and his real life persona. But I never, I never thought of him as, you know, being the, the self-destructive, oh man, he's gonna burn himself out by, you know, the age or whatever. It's almost something that he's been creating like he would a, a film or a comic book, the way most people create that, you know, My Chemical Romance itself is scrutinized to that level. I, I just find him, I just think he's fascinating, you know, he's just clearly very intelligent, very creative, um, very disturbed, just a, a sort of quietly charismatic guy. I don't think there's anything that he does that isn't out of, you know, pure creative energy and pure intelligence and, and calculations. Just an unbelievable, brilliant kid. The success of My Chemical Romance has also taken its toll on the band's most interesting character. Uh, there would be times where I would say to him, Gerard, you gotta cool down, dude, because you're, you're gonna drive yourself crazy. And he did, he really did. He was driving himself out of his mind. We would sit down and have talks about him you know, should I start taking antidepressants? Should I start doing this? I need to start seeing a therapist. And, you know, it was rough. It was really hard for him. And he went through this little time where he was agoraphobic, where he just wouldn't even leave his house. He, he's walking a fine line, you know, with between being very depressed and being extremely creative. And I know for uh, for a while he was turning to drugs and alcohol, uh, which he was he was really public about. But um, that is definitely in reaction to that depression, but that can also kill your creativity. So he's, I think he's got a delicate balance to maintain in order to stay ahead of everybody and to stay really creative and, and manage that depression and utilize it. I never thought that Gerard was this uh, self-destructive, uh, you know, uh, almost borderline insane person that he's been made out to be. He's always been really nice and really on point every time I ever met him. It, it, it makes him think so much that he kind of gets a little crazy sometimes and he, and, and he kind of loses, loses his grip on some stuff because he's always worried about other people. Yeah, we, uh, we recently did an interview with Gerard about the new album, which they've been writing for, they haven't quite gone into the studio yet. 
Yeah, the one thing that he was really emphasizing was that it's a more serious album. It's it's going to be even darker and more, you know, obsessed with death. Not that I would say that his the band's past uh, fixation with mortality was cartoonish, but I think he had a sense that maybe it was a little more childish, and a more a little more adolescent, and that this is going to be a more mature look at at mortality. I think if they play their cards right and uh, they sort of continue on the path that's been set out for them, that they're obviously going to improve their standings on the national level, but in a global sort of arena as well. And it, it, he's clearly, you know, wants to like grab the kids and like shake them and just sort of wake them up and like, you, you are going to die. <laughs> he's, he's a dark fellow. <laughs> As long as they, they don't burn themselves out, and as long as this next album, whatever album they put out next, as long as that's solid and they don't do anything that would either go against their own sensibilities or the sensibilities of the fans, that they should definitely have that staying power. When a, when a band reaches the stature that Mike Hem is, has gotten to, it's, it's interesting to think of what will be next for them because it's, it's not that they've peaked, but it's hard to tell what the next level is at this point, because, you know, last year they were the biggest band in the country. I think that their own worst enemy right now could be themselves and sort of second-guessing what they're doing. If they start second-guessing, that's when they're going to see that they're going to have problems, and they're sort of going to fall into that curse of, like, the next album where they sort of fall off the face of the planet and then have to fight even harder to gain that popularity back again, the next album. I think it'd be cool to see them explore different types of musical genres, you know, stuff that maybe people haven't heard yet, or, you know, experimenting a little bit. And I think they're a band that right now can get away with doing that. P. Diddy called them his boys, you know, on MTV. Their roots are in, in one scene, but they've matured to a different level. And I think they can do that and, and hopefully mature the music scene in general. There's no magic formula, you know, there's not like, um, you know, like we sit in a room and like, you know, we throw this there and then throw that there and throw this there, a little bit of salt and then you have a great chorus, like, or a great hook. It's all nat you know, it's natural and, um, you know, it just comes off the top of the head, but whenever you do hear something, you know, that hits you in the heart, you know, you really, you have a feeling that it's going to touch other people like that. I think they're just going to go and they're going to lock themselves up and they're going to just write songs that they want to write and I think they're not going to pay attention to anyone else and it's going to be a natural progression just like I brought you my bullets was the three cheers and I think it's going to be the same thing again and they're going to put out hopefully another solid album and they're just going to continue being the band that they are that you know all these young kids are identifying with. My Chemical Romance are one of contemporary rock's pivotal figures responsible for a catalogue of work that arouses respect, devotion and awe. Getting bigger by the day, they are poised to become one of the world's greatest rock bands. A stadium act that command massive sales and waves of critical acclaim.